Okay, world history. Here we are on a new unit and a new chapter. We're just going to do the first part of section one in chapter 10 today. Um, I realize that some of you have already read this, but I'm going to go over some of it and we'll pick it up Tuesday in class. So we're basically talking about the what we call the High Middle Ages, the Late Middle Ages, and then the transition to the modern period when we talk about the Renaissance and the Reformation, um, a time of, of an interesting combination of a rise of middle class so that you're going to have a lot of questioning of the whole concept of nobility and aristocracy. But at the same time, you're going to have a lot of centralized power happening so that we're going to move into an age of uh, absolute monarchy as well. And those are going to continue to conflict um, largely until we get into the 19th and 20th centuries. As we focus on this timeline, it's going to be focused a lot on non-Western sources. So obviously the Crusade is a Western uh, concept, but tied to the East. Uh, but Mali is um, Africa. Delhi is, of course, India. Mongols is a Chinese phenomenon in East Asia. The Golden Horde is going to be the Mongols coming into Russia. Yuan is another Chinese dynasty. The Avignon Papacy is when we have what's the, the so-called Babylonian captivity of the church. Again, another uh, Indian Empire. The Hundred Years' War will be one of the climactic events in the late Middle Ages in the West Benin will be another non-European phenomenon. Gutenberg Bible printed. Of course, that's going to lead to the whole flourishing of literacy, ongoing literacy in the West, and rapid communication. Fall of Constantinople is going to be a big event in the Eastern Empire, essentially the end of the Eastern Roman Empire, the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Songhai is another African empire. Henry VII, right before the Reformation, leading, of course, to Henry VIII and the monumental changes that will happen in England. Ferdinand and Isabella, of course, and the expansion of the West into the Americas through Columbus's journey and the whole age of exploration that's going to be happening during this time period. Erasmus publishes the Greek New Testament. That'll be very instrumental in the growth of the Reformation and the whole notion of ad fontis to the sources in the Renaissance, going back to the ancient authors themselves, rather than how they were interpreted by the medievalists and the scholastics. The 95 Theses is kind of when we officially note the beginning of the Reformation uh, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. The Reformation, of course, um, basically we have a first generation Reformation throughout Europe, and then 1648 is when the Westminster Standards are published, and so kind of an ongoing Reformation happening in England. Um, that leads to the Westminster Confession, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, etc. Uh, Henry VII becomes head of the English, Henry VIII, excuse me, and that's going to lead to the Reformation beginning in England. The Council of Trent is the Counter Reformation where the Catholics, the Roman Catholics, respond to the first generation of the Reformation. 
St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is where the French uh, king refuses the Reformation and so slaughters a bunch of the Huguenots, uh, the French Protestants. The Spanish Armada is defeated by Elizabeth I's um, British Navy, which again leads to the greater ascendancy of England as a world empire and the diminishing of Spain. The Edict of Nantes, um, I believe, was a declaration of toleration for Protestants. We'll double check that as we get into it. And of course, Jamestown is the first English colony in the Americas in Virginia. Quebec is the French colony in Quebec, Quebec City, uh, north of us. All right, so chapter 10, we're focusing on, continuing to focus on the West. So chapter 9 covered the, what we might call the early uh, Middle Ages. Now we're moving into the late Middle Ages, and we're going to see a lot of changes happening. As you can see in the first paragraph, it's a time of change and transition. We've had the establishment of feudalism, and that's all going to kind of begin to fall apart as people um, have a lot more contact with each other. And so you're going to become less dependent on a manorial system and more moving into something like what we all kind of take for granted today. So what are the big ideas for chapter 10? Uh, the growth of trade and the growth of towns. The key achievements of medieval learning and art, that's in section two. Um, the Roman church, and in a sense, both its greatest power, but also its beginning decline as we come to the Reformation and the modern era. And also the rise of nation states as we we kind of move from this decentralized feudalism where the kings don't have much power to a time where they, they do end up acquiring a lot more power and people start to think of themselves more in terms of, you know, well, we're French. We're not just, we don't just belong to this local baron, but we're part of a, we're part of a country. So again, we kind of take that for granted today, um, but that's what was happening in uh, the Middle Ages toward the end of it as we move to the modern period. So here's a picture of a European town and um, these are going to grow and grow until we get to you know the modern city um, and we're going to move from a time of having trade sort of outside of towns in, um, in fairs but then those are going to become more and more stabilized as the towns grow. So the revival of trade is what we're looking at today. Here are the guiding questions for section one. What encouraged the revival of trade? How did trade influence medieval life? 
and then what caused the growth of towns. So we're kind of going to kind of look at the first two of those in this lecture. How did the rise of towns affect justice, power, and citizenship? Again, these themes that we've been looking at through all of these different cultures. And again, a, a large factor of what you're going to see is people acquiring individual wealth which eventually is going to lead to them wanting individual land uh, so that they can kind of chart their own destiny. And um, so it's going to, again, be kind of challenging this whole class division between nobility and peasantry. Uh, the peasants and the rise of a middle class are going to lead people to want to make their own claims. Um, So the revival of trade and the growth of towns, here we are on page 203. So again, the early Middle Ages, what we covered in chapter nine, trade had sharply declined. Uh, again, travel was treacherous. There's, um, you know, the, the Baron is able to kind of ensure justice on his own manner, but not necessarily traveling between the different manners. And obviously the manners didn't encompass the whole area of Europe. So there are places where bandits could hide out, uh, outlaws. Um, you know, you think of Robin Hood and his merry men and how they're able to kind of be in Sherwood Forest and keep away from, um, from the sheriff of Nottingham. Um, so that made trade difficult. And so therefore there was not contact um, with different cultures um, and the ability to engage in this kind of activity. And the manors um, were the economic centers and the manors were largely um, self-sufficient. So there just wasn't that great need for trade. Now, of course, that, that means that there isn't much cultural development, cultural advancement. Um, you know, there are some pockets of learning that are going on in monasteries, but, um, you know, this is part of the reason why people often refer to these early Middle Ages as the, the so-called Dark Ages. Now, we've, we've shown, and you've got, a, you've got a section in Chapter 9 that kind of challenges that notion. But, um, you know, there needs more to develop, and that's what's going to happen as the trade increases. Now, it's not like they're entirely gone. There is some, but it's severely limited. And unlike the days of the empire, where you had this ability to travel throughout the entire region, you don't have great cities um, like you saw during the empire, where you had an Alexandria, you had a Rome, you had a, um, and, and of course today, where you see great cities like New York City, London, places of that nature, which were it's really during the end of this time period where they're starting to have their ascendancy, not New York City, of course, um, but places like London and Paris and, um, and eventually cities in Germany as well. So the towns begin to um, develop as places where you can set up markets um, and do more business than just the farming that happens on the manor. So the ability to conduct commerce across regions is part of what is going to lead to the revival of trade and the subsequent increase of wealth and prosperity that's going to happen. So the Mediterranean, which was, of course, very dominant in the Roman Empire, continues to be um, a place of great trade, but it's not the the European Christians, well, not the Western European Christians that are involved in this, they're, they're developing their feudal manners. Instead, it's the Byzantine Empire and the increasing Muslim uh, civilization um, that is continuing to dominate the Mediterranean and this region of the world. But you do see the ascendancy of Italian cities, again, those located on the Mediterranean and able to interact with these Eastern merchants, places like Venice, Pisa, and Genoa. 
And as a result of this, you do start to then to see more of an interaction between the orient, which again, that's just another term that means the east, you're oriented toward the sun. So the orient is the east and uh, Western Europe. So there's three principal routes. You've got the southern route, which ends up coming up through the Red Sea. And so you've got to transport uh, just a short um, way at the end of the Red Sea coming up through Egypt. You've got a central route that ends up coming up through um, the Persian Gulf and going to Damascus. And then you've got a, a northern route, the Silk Road, which we, we've talked about that a little bit more when we've looked at um, India and China. So Italy controlled the Mediterranean trout trade route, but Flanders was the marketplace. Flanders is in Northern Europe, and you can see where it is on the map here on page 204. Flanders is the crossroads of Northern Europe. The, the Flemish are the people who live in Flanders. So that's what that term Flemish means. So here's your map on page 204. And again, you can see at the bottom in the center, you can see the southern trade route. You can then, so it comes all the way up and goes through Alexandria. Then you can see the central trade route that comes up the Persian Gulf and leads to Baghdad and Damascus. Again, these are, these are Muslim areas. Um, and then the, the Silk Road is the one on the right center. And that would sort of allow you to, to somewhat bypass the Muslim areas uh, and go directly to the Eastern empires, the Chinese and the Indians. Um, so that's what's, uh, that's what's happening here. And then you can see those three Italian cities there, Venice, um, Pisa, and Genoa. And the, the also Florence is going to become important here. And you can see there a picture of uh, Champagne, uh, Champagne in France, that's going to become an important uh, place where fairs would happen. Um, and the reason why Cham Champagne becomes important is because the local lord there doesn't charge taxes to, he allowed free, uh, free trade, if you will, to come through his area. So, and then you see Flanders there in the north, and Paris and London, which are going to become increasingly <clears throat> important. Now the Hanseatic League trade routes there in Northern Europe, we're not gonna talk about them till we get to the end here of section one. <coughs> All right, markets and fairs. So markets become important on a local level, and then essentially they're gonna become more and more established, um, more and more places where you can set up a market permanently and not just have one that, that exists for a while and then is taken down. So look there at page, uh, bottom of page 204, where did the weekly trade um, meetings happen? And then how were the serfs beginning to acquire wealth that allowed them to um, start to kind of chart their own, their own way, <clears throat> which eventually is gonna to lead to them demanding their own rights, okay? And then how did the manors and the towns interact? So read this bottom paragraph here, bottom page 204, it's got some important data about the development of this. So here at the top of page 205, um, the trade fairs were sometimes operated on a much larger scale, uh, these sort of annual trade fairs where people would gather together in one place and there'd be all kinds of things happening there. And that's where you would see um, these Eastern traders would actually come into Western Europe they weren't just sitting there at ports in the Mediterranean in Genoa and Pisa. 
but they were actually traveling up because that allowed them to get more direct profit. So, um, you know, it's not that all of them did that, but there was, that's part of what was leading to this greater interaction between East and West and people becoming aware of more of what was going on in the world. So again, it's a shrinking world because people are becoming much more familiar with the, the Muslims, which were called Mohammedans back then, right? Followers of Muhammad. And also, um, you know, spices from India, silk from China, all these kinds of different things that they're becoming aware of as they begin to um, partake of these goods. One of the most famous important of the medieval fairs was held in Champagne. And again, the reason because the local count would uh, grant safe conduct. So look at the sidebar here on page 205. What were some of the good things that would happen there? as well as what were some of the, the dangers that might you might encounter as you went to the fair. Um, and you can sometimes see these fairs portrayed in movies about medieval life and, you know, the local acrobat will come in and, and do a show and, and uh, sometimes some, some bad things will happen there because it's difficult for the, for the law elements to, um, to keep track of everything because there's a lot of different people there. Again, the fair was popular because the local lord allowed free passage. All right, the advent of money. So again, there's bartering going on because all trade in the feudal period is kind of local. You don't need to have money in order to be able to transport a lot of wealth between different areas, but that's starting to break down. And so therefore money becomes much more uh, important. And again, there's money in the Roman Empire. I think I showed you guys some coins of different emperors. Uh, and it's not like money completely goes away. Um, you know, I think Charlemagne minted some, some currency, but it just isn't needed the way it becomes needed as trade increases and the way, you know, again, we just sort of take it for granted today. So there's only local currencies going on. And so this is why you have a class of money changers that can help you negotiate between different currencies, um, help you understand the value of the coins you're using. Um, and one of the things that we need to realize is, you know, we use a paper currency today, but back then, and it's kind of a shame that we don't have it anymore, but you would have actual currency based on actual precious metals, you know, gold, silver, copper, things of that nature. And um, in our modern world, we've sort of moved away from that. And I think there's some problematic elements to that. But anyway, um, this is part of the reason you need a money changer to kind of help you understand exactly how much gold or silver is in this currency, as opposed to much less valuable um, much less valuable metals that might be part of it. So what did they do? There's several different activities that they're engaged in here in the middle of page 205. Now, not only were they looking at the actual currency, but they begin to offer these other services as people made money, you weren't always spending it. Um, you sometimes, you know, sold a lot of goods. And so therefore you had all this money and you didn't want to just keep it stored in a chest. Um, you didn't necessarily have a castle of your own to protect it. And so you'd go to the money changer and ask him to store it. But also, you know, maybe you have a bunch of money, but you don't want to have to carry it on a large journey that you're gonna take, you know, cause you're gonna go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land or something and you wanna make an offering there. And instead of, you know, carrying this chest of treasure around, you get a letter of credit so that, um, um, and then the money changers have to figure out how to, to get the money back and forth to each other. Um, and so again, you see the beginnings of, of um, and, and you know, one of the things you may not be aware of is that 
banks are just huge in our modern economy. Um, you know, there's banks everywhere, and some of these banks are massive. Um, you've got central banks and national banks, and and um, so the beginnings of that system are happening here in the late Middle Ages. So the word bank comes from banca, which is the bench here where the money changers are. And you can see that up here at the bottom of page 205. Now, what was the church's um, reaction to this? Well, again, you've got the limitations of the feudal system and um, And again, the church is involved in every aspect of life. And so, of course, they're going to be involved in eco economics. And so there was this idea that you don't rip people off, right? The Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. It has something to say about the whole notion of economics. It's not just about when you um, break into um, somebody's house. Or, or, you know, the, the Bible says something about just weights and measures, right? Um, that you're not supposed to just be totally um, directed by your own greed, which could lead you to do things that aren't truthful. So, um, so this whole idea of a just price was encouraged, um, which, again, there could be a, a, a disincentive to profit. So you have to kind of balance these things because usually what is going to motivate people is an incentive to profit. Um, so how do you balance that? You know, you want to work hard because you're going to get some return on your efforts. On the other hand, you're not supposed to do it in such a way that you, um, you know, you do harm to your neighbor. Um, you know, when you look at the Bible closely, it, it actually has a lot to say about hard work and how that not only benefits yourself, right? God blesses the work of your hands, but it benefits others as well. Um, and so it's it's not what we call a zero sum game where, you know, there's only so much out there and you got to work hard and grab it first because otherwise you're not going to get any. No, God has given us a creation to take dominion over. And so it's not a zero sum game where there's haves and have, have nots. It's all about working hard. It's all about helping others, even as you benefit yourself. So now the question of usury, you know, you've got this increasing dependence on currency and money. And what do you do with it when you've got extra? And this is an interesting question. A guy like John Calvin's going to come along in the Reformation and basically challenge some of the medieval notions of usury and sort of give justification for how, you know, even though you shouldn't be exorbitant about the interest you charge, um, there can be some limited place. Now, of course, in our modern era, that's become just way overblown, just as, just as the state has become much more huge in terms of taxes. So the, um, the modern era of uh, of interest has become much more than it should be. But anyway, it's an interesting question. So the revival of trade brought new opportunities and incentives. And that I think is where we're going to wrap it up today. Um, Sound economic principles made for Europe's prosperity. What were those economic principles? You can see it here in the middle of page 206.